Welcome to the Paradise Paradox. Today I'm presenting another part of my interview with Andrake, otherwise known as Andrew Levine, talking about his crowdsourced book about the evolution of information. So we talk about the general trends in the universe, entropy, chaos, the bubbles of order that pop up, and the informational perspective on the universe. We also talk about artificial intelligence and whether the Big Bang is a real story or it's just a fun story invented by scientists because they didn't know what else to do. So remember, jump on to YouTube. You can subscribe on YouTube, get videos every Monday coming out for you. And you can jump on Facebook, press like on our page, The Paradise Paradox, Crazy Ideas for Open-Minded People. You can also subscribe on iTunes and on Pocket Casts or whatever app you use for downloading podcasts. So. Let's get into it. So I guess to to try and start to predict um, what might happen in the future. The, the idea is to identify the trends or the tendencies. So I guess one might be from the time of the Big Bang to, to now, um, it would be one of complexity, like the things um, in certain pockets of the universe tend to get more complex, like, like with us. Um, are there any other tendencies of the universe that you could identify already or so there's a universal tendency towards uh stability in so 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 um what, what you're talking about is something hidalgo talks about in the evolution uh oh, sorry in why every why information grows and so what, what we see is that uh there is that there's a universal tendency towards chaos towards entropy, uh, but within this net chaotic universe, there are pockets of order, which we call uh, information. Uh, so, well, yeah, there are pockets of order, another word for which is, is like physical information. What happens is that, w so we are in a pocket of order within the universe. So. Um, you basically have kind of two competing forces. You have instability and stability. And so like one of the starting positions of the book is that so, so people think about the Big Bang and they think of it in lots of weird ways, especially when you come at it from my, from my philosophy. You know, like when people talk about how the, the first solar systems evolved, you know, how the stages of the universe progressed. What they usually do is they talk about it in terms of, well, this happened and then this happened and then that happened and the world, like the universe cooled. And then you're like, but, but why, why did it cool? You're just saying something happened, you know? <laughs> and, and the way that I explain it, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but kind of the, um, and I, one of the conclusions you get when you come at it from my premises is that the what the Big Bang is, is it's a state of infinite instability. And so in a state of infinite instability, there's only one direction to go, and that's towards stability. And so, you know, of course, none of us know what happens before the Big Bang, but there are two possibilities. There seem to be roughly two possibilities, which is either basically God creates an infinitely unstable state, and God might be another type of entity, another organism, it might be another version of us, whatever, who knows. or the universe is in a constant state of flux from infinitely instable to maximally stable, at which point it reverses direction until it hits a point where it's maximally 
unstable and then it has to go the other direction and it has to vacillate between those two things. And when you look at the evolution of the universe in that way, it's staggering because it, it is um, orthodox physics to say that every stage of the universe, what we think of as the universe, which is the ordered parts of the universe, right? We think about the solar systems. We think about the planets, the stars. These are all the ordered parts of the universe. We don't think about the disordered. Um, all of those, every state is more stable than the state that came before it. It has to be. It has to be true. And I think it's really interesting that we never explain the evolution of the universe in those terms. You know, the earliest phase of the universe we understand is a state of pure energy. And after that, you start getting certain elementary particles. A state of pure energy is just insanely unstable. And of course, new particles are a much more stable form. And if you look at the phases, of course, each phase is longer in time than the previous phase. Because the definition of stability is that it lasts longer. Stable things last longer. Um, but... To get back to your question of what, what this enables us to say about the future, the way I would put it is, this train of thought leads me to believe that intelligence, that the best definition of intelligence is the ability to receive, store, mutate, and transmit information. And what I think we will see is that what we do going forward will be human beings continuing to develop tools that facilitate the mutation and transmission of information. I think that humans will continue to play a very important role. I think that people have very weird ideas about artificial intelligence where they go, where they talk about things like, you know, will, will robots have wants and desires and things like that? And it's like, only if you program them to, but isn't that our unique value proposition? That's, that's just bad engineering to program a thing to do something that you already do as opposed to programming it to do something else. And it doesn't, it, it just doesn't seem to make much sense to me to go, you know, okay, there's all this stuff that computers are really, really good at. Let's, instead of focusing on that, let's figure out how to make them mimic human attributes. The most important of which is that human beings are fundamentally, consistently, and universally irrational. Irrational. Machines are rational. That's what's great about them. That's what's useful about them. They obey very straightforward rules. And when, we're, when people are talking about it, and I understand that they don't realize this is what they're saying, but I challenge anyone to prove me wrong on this. But whenever people are talking about artificial intelligence being similar in certain ways to human intelligence, fear, anger, egomania, destructive behaviors, which I'm not saying are not concerns. I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about the potential negative consequences of artificial intelligence. But I find it very weird that when people are talking about many of the problems of artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, they're talking about irrational behaviors. They're talking about fearing machines acting in irrational ways. And it's just like they will only act in irrational ways if we program them to, 
because that's not a natural thing. But I, and I think, I believe that what that train of thought stems from, and this is the real test, because if you can prove to me that that train of thought does not stem from irrational premises, then, then I'll be wrong. But I think what that train of thought stems from is the irrational belief that humans are rational. So if any, argu if any arguments hmm. are founded on the assumption that human beings are irrational, are ra are, sorry, rational, then we can immediately dismiss those arguments. That's, that's an easy one um, because we're not. Um, that doesn't mean we can't be. It doesn't mean we're always irrational, um, though we are. We're always irrational. We can articulate rational points. So our irrational minds are capable of generating rational points, which other people then can analyze. And so, and we can work together to move forward with better understand, with a better understanding of, of reality. I think that one of my natural talents is being irrationally rational, but the belief that rationality is good, you know, if you fundamentally believe that rationality is a good thing, that logic is a good thing, which I do, um, you also have to admit that that's an irrational belief of you, of yours, right? I like logic. I like rationality. I'm not covering that up. Those are irrational. It's an emotional, um, irrational tendency of mine. But you, that doesn't mean you don't have to prove my points wrong. Terence McKenna puts, puts it like this when he talks about the, the Big Bang Theory. He says... The, the attitude of scientists is something like, give me one free miracle and I'll explain the rest. The Big Bang is, is, is the miracle. So how do, like, how do we know that even happened? So would you be willing to, to explore other models that, that didn't involve, that don't involve the Big Bang? Or is that, that's just, uh, um, that's some, something you're basing this, this project on, so you're gonna go with that? I am very open. Yeah. To other explanations. However, I would, re I would phrase it a bit differently. The Big Bang, the Big Bang is, um, a cultural, is a social construct that is itself the product of countless social constructs. In that sense, the Big Bang is completely unreal in the sense that everything that we're talking about is unreal. So I call these cameras, I call them cameras. They are not cameras. C cameras, the word camera is a group of sounds that I make to communicate to you a type of thing that I'm talking about. But for example, anybody watching this video, including you, because you can't see my cameras, when I say that these are cameras, you form an image of a camera in your mind that is very different than the cameras that are really here, right? You know, um, so, you know, the construct of camera that you have in your mind right now is not real. It's not accurate. It's not based on reality. You know, it, it's a group of social constructs, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I, that's the way I'm most open to that argument. What I would say is, you know, and I think that's, it's a good point that you made, you know, like what are the, um, you know, the anchors on which this philosophy rests or, you know, yeah. what's that expression with the, the petard, you know, uh, I don't know. Hoist on your own petard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The petards on which I'm hoisting my logic or whatever. <laughs> okay. I, see those, the foundations, and, and see these are the ones that I would say, well, disprove these, and yes, you've disproven mine. But I don't think my fundamental assumptions would disagree with his, as somebody who does, is not very familiar with McKenna's work. What I would say is that I, 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 I will maintain that everything is information, and all information evolves. And so when we look at the evolution of the universe, we, we can track it one way. So what we, what we tend to do 
is track it um, on a dimension called time that human beings perceive in a certain way, in a linear way. But time from, and Jesus, wow, is physics not my strong suit? But from what I understand, time is only a dimension and our perception of it is, is very much subjective. And so there's no reason that you can't take time and flip it in reverse, uh, theoretically, and, 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 and make that as legitimate a um, mode of analyzing reality as the inverse, which is what humans merely have a tendency to do. We, have a ten we do it because it's how we perceive it. We say um, the Big Bang led to light, led to matter, led to solar systems, planets, life. Um, but that is based on an interpretation of time that is irrational, to go back to our earlier point. It's irrational to view time that way. It's human. It's very human, and humans are irrational. And so the question I would ask is, what happens when you view time in reverse to the universe. And what you see is matter moving in very predictable ways, uh, mainly breaking apart into more disordered pieces, more simple pieces, to use the inverse of complexity, which is the term you used before. And so from there, uh, it makes very rational sense to extrapolate to a maximally disordered and maximally unstable state, which I would refer to for sake of common ground as the Big Bang. But, but, but uh, yeah, I'm not making any especially forceful conclusions with respect to what the Big Bang is. I, I think the, the, the strongest conclusion I would make is that it is the most disordered, unstable state of the fundamental unit of information. Does that, does the, how does that con contrast with what McKenna says, do you, do you think? I don't remember the the full context, but it's his his point is basically that that the Big Bang is is an assumption that we do, we don't really know what happened, um, but he's talking, I guess, about something slightly more specific than what you are, like like this the matter just springing into being out of out of nothingness, um, which yeah your 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 version of it is slightly, uh, yeah, slightly less specific. I'm very, I'm very open to those alternative perspectives and I'm even open, and this is a very, very hard concept for me to articulate. So I'll try my best, but like, I'm even open to the idea that all of this stuff is some abstraction, you know, I, I like uh, one of the one of the conclusions that I kind of come to is that if everything is information and if we define a simulation and this goes back to uh, something Luke Stokes talked about in his article and, you know, is tangentially related to kind of everything we've been talking about, this idea of living in a simulation. But if you define a simulation as I would as a purely informational environment. That's how I would define a simulation. And you know, and this is another, this goes back to the homocentric nature of things, where people, when they talk about simulations, when they talk about us being in a simulation, when you, when you hear Elon Musk talking about, well, in the future, in a future society will be capable of creating a simulation that is so much like real life that it will be impossible to discern it and we are more likely to be in that than to be not in it. You know, we all conjure up images of like a simulation running on a computer that humans made. 
You know, it's a very, it's still a homocentric interpretation of what a simulation is. We assume that it's and not only homocentric, but chronocentric. We're assuming hmm. that a simulation is something a human makes in 2016, but better, but like a little bit better, you know? And one of the things that I, I like to talk about, I hope it's addressed in the book, is how we can't think about, oh, and this goes back to the artificial intelligence and super intelligence conversation, uh, which, and this is an error that I think many people fall into, which is this idea that we can A, think like an artificial intelligence will think like, which is a fundamentally absurd concept. We can't because we won't be that. You know, if things are different, if things think differently, you can't think like them. We can't think like a super intelligence because we're not super intelligences. In fact, we can't even think like slightly more intelligent people. <laughs> yeah. And nor, nor can we think in the, not just in the, like the, the, the quality, like the, in the intelligence, um, but in terms of the, the mode of thinking. I'm sure we all do everything a little bit differently. You know, we, yeah. all, we all have different experiences and that changes us. And so we all think differently. Um, what's interesting is how society, you know, and this, this, this again goes back to a common thread of ours, which is how much of society seems dedicated to convincing people that they shouldn't be thinking differently. Yeah, 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 yeah